All right. I love this. I got this image. Uh, my Aussie friend who I worked with in the Northern Territory, she had she loved this zebra and losing the stripes and stress. And I always thought, yeah, it's really cool. And I thought, you know, maybe I should get a, I tried to get a kangaroo one or something, but I could never come up with one that was quite as effective as this one. But here are the five dimensions of secondary trauma and compassion fatigue impact. And, and you, and we'll talk, I will talk about how you might recognize. First is the biophysical. And because our brains developed over time through evolutionary biology, in in ancient times, it was the what we call the reptilian brain, and that's the hippocampus and the amygdala. The amygdala is about the size of most people's thumbs. It's the warning center. It activates that fight, fly, freeze response, and in some case, our fawn response with some. And to release more cortisol. Now that plays a role. You don't want to get rid of it because in, at times that might save your life. Like I was talking with a guy who worked in the remote Northern Territory out on the rivers and there are crocodiles, saltwater crocodiles out there. He needs that. We all need that at times. It's when it gets stuck in the on position. That's what happens with trauma. When people develop complex PTSD, that's what people like me and others help them to turn off. The psychological that sense of powerlessness and hopelessness, isolation, suicide extreme. And by the way, I would say, referencing the work of uh, Aaron Beck, the late Aaron Beck, and his daughter Judy's on this uh, summit, super summit, basically hopelessness is the tipping point for suicide. When someone tell, has told me You're, I'm suicidal, I am very concerned. I go in, we make a plan, etc. But I get more worried when someone says, my life is hopeless. Because they might not be suicidal, but chances are they will. And, and the people who tell me they're suicidal, if I ask them, oh, they'll say, well, I told you because I, I want you to help me get some help so that I don't attempt suicide. All right, we can do that. I've done that with hundreds of patients. The spiritual or cultural, and I'm throwing culture in here also because the spiritual is also part of culture. That's the loss of meaning and purpose. All right. Disconnection from cultural support systems. That's that social isolation of community of colleagues, family, and friends. That, and I put those, uh, mention those out of whack. And the occupational, if, if this is an issue, if trauma is an issue, if compassion fatigue is an issue, you're going to be less fulfilled on your job. You're going to be less productive. You, you, you just don't have the energy. All right. And again, self-care, which has a lot of dimensions, I'll mention five particularly, it starts with you. It starts with you looking in the mirror and saying, what's my self-care plan? How do I take care of this person I see in the mirror? How do I prevent vicarious trauma? How do I prevent burnout? How do I uh, work on myself? so that I have those support systems, so I have that sense of purpose, so that when hard things happen, when people I love die, when divorce happens or a job, unexpected job loss or anything else, I have the grounding that I can get through that with support from loved ones, with my spiritual community, with my family, etc. So you can't pour from an empty cup. You can't give something you don't have. I tried to do that for too long, and it re there was a heavy cost to it. I, I came to understand about hopelessness. Thankfully, that got me into therapy, <laughs> where a really simple, low-key therapist helped me re rebound and find my way out of that. It took a lot of work. I learned a lot. Funny thing is, sometimes you have to be in crisis to learn a lot. All right, what is compassion fatigue? Well, it's physical, emotional, spiritual exhaustion. It, you just don't care as much. It's the cost for caring. You know, you just, you only have so much and you're worn out, you're overworked. And I'm thinking about people in war zones, you know, who are certainly, they're, they're working there, they're gonna have compassion fatigue. I think about some of the uh, emergency room people I've trained, you know, and worked with in terms of uh, self-care plans and dealing with stress and how ex emotionally exhausted they are. And there's that sense of feeling overwhelmed. 
And again, professionals working with high needs populations have a much greater susceptibility to this. And Vanderkoek talks a lot about that. Both he talks about the research and he talks about his own case, so how he almost burned out. What's the way out of that? Practicing every day, healthy daily self-care. Those three gratitudes I talked about that I start with every morning after my meditation or even during it, that's the first step because it reminds me that even things are hard, that it's still worth it. You, you know, it, it's like that old saying, uh, you know, from Nietzsche, and I'm going to modernize it. The person with a why can endure almost any how. So when you have meaning and purpose, which are part of the self-care plan, that's your why. It helps you endure all those tough hows that your life is going to throw up for you. All those existential givens, you know, that I mentioned earlier. All right. Now here, ha, so how do I know when I'm struggling with so with uh, compassion fatigue or maybe burnout? Well, here's some ways I've noticed in people. It's self-blaming, very self-critical, maybe of yourself and because that happens a lot and also of others. Chronic negativity. You have you have a negative filter because that's how you're feeling. So you're feeling that on the inside and you're reflecting that outward. And you're starting to isolate because you just don't feel well about yourself. It's very common to medicate with uh, alcohol and other drugs. And alcohol is the gateway drug. I think about Gabor Mate, and I, I, I'm pretty much in line with him on this. He's the Canadian psychiatrist originally from Hungary. And he, he was a war uh, POW and he had complex trauma. And he said, basically, when I hear that somebody's an addict, I'd say to myself, what's their trauma? He'd say, he would say, don't tell me about your addiction. Tell me about your trauma. I have found that as an addiction counselor to be very similar. You feel mentally and physically drained. You've been in bed a lot, but you don't feel rested. Your sleep is not good. And if your sleep's not good, you're going to suffer. You don't have much empathy left for your clients and patients or even yourself. And your self-talk is really negative. I wonder if you've noticed this in yourself. I, the first thing I notice is my self-criticism and my negative self-talk. Hey, you've probably noticed uh, some, maybe uh, some of your colleagues or family members who are chronically negative in the workplace or at home. You, you, you may have concerns about self-medication with alcohol or other drugs, etc. These are all signs to look at, both in yourself and in other people. Now, when I was a young fellow, my grandparents were raising me and my four siblings. They, did, they were very impoverished, but they made things work. We didn't even have a car. This was way back in rural Arkansas. We got our first car when my oldest brother got a job in high school. And he got a used car, which barely ran, <laughs> falling apart. <laughs> he had a friend who could help him keep it going. But he had this one cool instrument in the car. Had this someone, it didn't come when it was made in the assembly uh, plant, but he, someone had put this RPM monitor, and it looks a lot like the one I've got in my PowerPoint. It was really cool. It would glow in the dark. I loved that. It was the one that was riveted. And I said to him one time, Pat, what is that? And he explained, he said, it's revolutions per minute. And he said, I, I said, well, what's the red line area there? He said, well, if you run your vehicle, too, in that red line too long, you'll burn your engine up and it'll cease functioning. It won't run any longer. The same is true of us. There's a red line and I scale it as one to 10. You know, um, it's very common in trauma work and in other uh, approaches like solution focused therapy. On a scale of one to 10 with how stressed you are with one, I'm not stressed at all. And 10, I'm extremely stressed. What's your number? So clients and patients would say, come in and they say it's nine. I'll say, okay. And they'll say, I want to get it down to a one. And I said, well, okay, but it might be in steps. What can we do today just to get it down one point, right? Because you'll burn out. So here's the thing. When, when you are really stressed, it's really important to seek out your support systems, but it's also important sometimes to realize it might be by degrees. What's one thing you can do to get your stress level down one or two points? Well, for me, it's talking with my spouse or a friend. For me, it's working out. Sometimes just a walk if I'm at work. For me, uh, you know, it's meditating. <laughs> Those are three of my go-tos 
is right there. It's also me saying, okay, reframe your thoughts to be more optimistic and realistic. This, and my, that would go like, this stress is going to pass. I am 63 years old and I know it will pass. Gotta tell you, one of the great things about getting old, I know it's gonna pass. But I did not know that when I was 20 years old. And that was, was when it was really hard, all right? That's why uh, having friends and, and, and therapists and a sense of purpose and reframing our self-talk to say this is going to is really important. Your, your beliefs are a lot. If you believe something long enough or say something, tell yourself something long enough, you're going to believe it. That's good and bad. 